before we get started. So today we'll be talking about fatigue, which I'm sure all of you are feeling right now. <laughs> I know. Engineering jokes. Yay. Okay. <clears throat> Any other qu questions, be concerns before we go? All right. Cool. <clears throat> so let's talk about fatigue. So uh, fatigue in general, so this is now, uh, we're skipping ahead a few chapters in the Myers and Chala book, this is chapter 14 in there, uh, and I've given you my notes from last year, I'll be trying to finish up the notes for that, uh, the, the formal typed up notes sometime today or tomorrow, um, but this is the cyclic degradation in mechanical properties, or the, the degradation of mechanical properties with cycles, increased cycles on the material. Sick. Like degradation in mechanical properties. So the reasons for fatigue are directly tied to fracture. So um, in general, generally because of fracture. Um, this happens even when we're not applying plastic, or we're not plastically deforming our samples. Happens even in elastic deformation. I'm gonna put elastic in quotes here because there's no true thing as elastic deformation. Um, and the exact me mechanisms for it depend on the microstructure. So I'm going to show you a couple images now of these types of uh, what uh, what a typical <coughs> what a typical fatigue problem would look like. There we go. Cool. So uh, this is an example of a rod in tension that's been fatigued. So. What you generally have, this is this is kind of a characteristic image of a, of a fatigued broken beam. What you see at the bottom is there's some uh, initial imperfection or surface crack that would have started uh, served as a failure initiation point. That crack would have grown through cyclic loading on, on the specimen until eventually it got to some critical length at which point the thing would have broken. And so you see this point, uh, a center point where the crack starts growing, a growth region where this where this uh, where it's being fatigued and the strength is being degraded and then a rough surface and that rough surface again uh, would have uh, voids and cracks and pores opening up and that's why you see the roughness on there and so this is part of what you'll see in the lab this week there's now uh, I found in, in looking for images on this there was a nice call back to the to the de Havilland problem so this is now that window, that corner around the de Havilland uh, frame. And so here, this is that square window or square-ish window. This would have been where a crack started because of that stress concentration around that window. That crack would have then grown slowly over time. Uh, and you see uh, here the total pressure cycles. Um, I don't know if you can read those super well, but um, they're all pretty close. So the crack would have started off fairly small and remained pretty small until it wasn't. And then it started. It would have started to grow very quickly. And so you see on the order of tens of cycles, it would have grown inches uh, before eventually it got so big that the whole fuselage fractured. Um, and so this is that uh, type of fracture problem in action in the skin of this aluminum aircraft. Um, but. It's, in general, a, a big problem that you see in all kinds of parts. So here, this is another example. Uh, you see this growth region <coughs> where this is where cracks are opening up and growing, and then eventually a fracture region. Uh, and then there was a couple of nice images of, of this happening in different systems, where you can see for more ductile metals, you might have more growth of that crack before fracture. And for less, for less ductile metals, it might be less growth uh, before fracture. And so, Today I'm going to talk about how we actually quantify that from an engineering standpoint. 
my screen wasn't sent back. I don't know. It switches to the computer automatically when I plug it in, and it doesn't switch back to the dock cam when I unplug it. Don't understand. Okay, so uh, what's happening now? Uh, this is so. This is generally a problem in metals. Um, it can happen in ceramics, but um, traditionally we, we think of it in terms of metals and, and polymers, ductile materials. Uh, so we have a mechanism is cracks grow over time, then cause fracture. So we start off in a material with some crack of size A. That crack then gets pulled. There we go. Um, with some stress. And then when we release that stress, uh, there's been some new, some plastic deformation around the tips of that crack. And this crack is now some new distance, or some new length A plus delta A. So depending now on the exact magnitude of the stress that we apply, uh, that crack will grow differently. But now because our crack is grower, is grower, our, now because our crack has grown, because it is longer, um, we can say that the critical stress uh, that can be withstood. So the, the max stress uh, before fracture is that KIC over square root of pi A. Now with every cycle this A is growing. So the max stress before fracture decreases as cracks grow. So this is mechanistically what's happening. If you if you ever see a part now, uh, an engineering bolt or something that, that has a smooth kind of wavy surface and then a, a rough broken surface, that is a fatigue problem. And even though the bolt may have been initially strong enough in your design, over time the cycles applied to it would have caused it to fracture. Um, so from an engineering standpoint, what do we think about, how do, how do we actually quantify this degradation in mechanical properties? So now we have to look at, uh, I'm going to give you some, some terminology, which is less than exciting, but um, load cycle terminology. So for fatigue, we're specifically looking at now the number of cycles that a part can take before it fails. So for metals, uh, this mechanism, we, we assume that at some applied stress, a crack grows a fixed amount, delta A, and it stays at that fixed growth amount. For a ceramic or a glass, if you apply a, a fixed stress and you hold it there, the crack can grow over time, but in metals, so, so that's why this, the, the same fatigue ideas don't apply as well to ceramics uh, and to glasses, but here, um, here we assume that each cycle that we're applying only grows a fixed amount and we have to release that load and then change it or uh, cycle that load through to, to actually affect how much the crack has grown. So if we just apply a static load, a constant static load, it won't actually cause the crack to grow that much. Um, so what we look at now is the stress that I'm applying over some time t. This is going to be some uh, represented as a sinusoid. Uh, and I'm going to say that there's some now maximum stress. <coughs> so some <coughs> max minimum stress, and now some stress amplitude. So uh, max min or the max min stress applied, the stress amplitude now sigma A equals sigma max minus sigma min 
over 2. Um, and now we're, uh, this is the stress to amplitude. And then I have a mean stress, which is the average stress now. So sigma max plus sigma min over 2, which is the mean. mean stress. So now if I have um, say some stress that's uh, consistently non-zero I could still define now a mean stress there sigma mean and some stress amplitude. Sorry, I guess the stress amplitude I'm defining is the this is twice the stress amplitude, the total thing. So this is my stress amplitude. Still T, still sigma, over time. There we go. Uh, I can also define a stress ratio, which isn't as important, so I'm not going to talk about it. So now what we're looking at is how many cycles of stress, so how many, how many times I've applied some stress and what the amplitude of that stress is and what the, the mean stress there is. So what we now can look at, uh, what we now normally end up with from an engineering standpoint is something called an SN curve. So here, look at SN curves. This now, S is for stress, N is the number of cycles. So, S for stress, uh, N is cycles. And what I have for this, this is normally plotted in or in one of two ways. I'm going to plot it first in a log log plot, or a semi log plot, and then a log log plot. So here I'm going to be plotting the stress amplitude. So uh, here I'm going to call it SA is the same as my sigma A, which is my stress amplitude. But I'm going to call it. S because they're SN curves. Move this over. And this is my number of cycles to failure. So now if I have uh, zero cycles and I want to figure out what stress I have to apply to cause something to fail, I'm here. So this is just one loading cycle, uh, which would be now the yield stress of my material. So some um, sigma yield there. Uh, and now if I, uh, so, so what I would do in testing this out to actually get an SN curve is I would take A bar and apply a certain stress amplitude to it or take say five or six bars, apply a certain stress amplitude to them and see when how many cycles it took before they failed. And I would do that at varying stress amplitudes, increasing and decreasing. And what you would see is at some applied stress, there would be kind of a range of stresses where these failed. So you would see some sort of a scatter at a lower stress amplitude, you would see some scatter at a lower stress amplitude, you would see some scatter. Uh, and then eventually this would start to kind of plateau out. So you end up with this sort of a characteristic curve. Um, it's actually more and then less. More and then more. So like this. Ah. Sorry. Give me one second to draw this properly. Maybe I'll draw a line and then 
So the slope in this region. So there's there's three fatigue regions that we normally talk about. There we go. There's still some scatter inside here where I'm measuring parts failing. Here we go. So uh, in here, there's generally a low cycle fatigue. Uh, sorry, and this is uh, this is plotted on a log plot. So this is technically the log of the number of cycles to failure. Um, low cycle fatigue. This is high cycle fatigue, and this is. Uh, the endurance limit, or the, I guess, infinite. So for this, I'm going to draw a dash line now. Call this a sigma E. It's an E, if I can draw an E properly. There we go. So. Um, what so this is this is kind of a, a stereotypical or characteristic look at what say uh, a, a steel or titanium or, or tungsten rod would exhibit uh, if you tried to take all of those different samples to different fatigue limits. So what's happening now in these different regimes in low cycle fatigue we're applying very high stress. So we're applying stresses close to the yield strength of the material. Um, or close, uh, I guess, close to the ultimate strength of the material. So what this looks like, if I had some sort of now a, a stress strain curve, stress strain, what I'm doing is I'm applying stress in the plastic regime. So let's say I had some ultimate stress where this would fail. I'm not at that ultimate stress where it's going to cause failure to occur. Um, but I'm past the yield stress. So every time I, I deform, what's going to happen is I'm going to go up and along these. Until I eventually hit my ultimate strength. So you see in, in this low cycle fatigue now, I'm applying high stress and I'm uh, plastically deforming my material, or I'm well inside the, the plastic deformation regime. When we're applying these uh, stress amplitudes, is that always with respect to sigma mean being zero? Like, or is in sigma mean being, like, do you know what I mean? Like, when we're applying these cyclic stresses, is, is it always, like, for example, tensile? And with a stress amplitude of blah, 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 or is it, like, can it be around zero with, like, tension, pressure? You can have both, and then depending on, so there are different, um, there's a couple of correction rules that uh, determine how this fatigue behavior will change depending on what your mean stress is. So um, I might try to talk about it tomorrow uh, if we have enough time, but there's, so in a normal tension, in a normal fatigue test, you would be taking your cyclic load from zero to some sigma amplitude max. Sorry. Uh, this I'm saying to some sigma amplitude max. There we go. So you're staying inside this regime. And you're not actually technically hitting the ultimate strength of the material. Um, and you would be going from from zero to some stress amplitude max and back. So your mean stress would just be half of your max amplitude. You could do another test where you go tension, compression, tension, compression, and that would actually generally increase the fatigue life of your material um, or the, the, the measured fatigue life because compression doesn't open up those cracks as effectively uh, or doesn't cause cracks to, to grow. If you drew out that, that um, stress like cycle curve, the actual amplitude of that is really half of what we're calling the signal. Yes. So, 
Yes. Technically, this is probably two sigma y. Ah, uh, I'm messing up all the nomenclature here. I just want to ask yeah. to clarify because, like, when we say we're using sigma, it's like we're using half of what you're interpolating between. So I just want to clarify. Yeah. So this would, yeah. Technically, this would be uh, two my two times my sigma y. So. I'm going to change this and call this a sigma naught instead <laughs> to make things easier. Yes, because I'm defining stress amplitude as that half <coughs> height here. So if I were to, to be applying a cycle like this, there we go. If I were to be applying a cycle like this, my amplitude would actually be half of that. So I'd be going from here. Um, so on a time basis, I would be doing something like that. Yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I don't know if I answered it or you could, oh, if I clarified it. Okay, cool. So, uh, rolling back <coughs> for the test because we won't have actually covered this material in a homework or in a lab or in any amount of depth, there'll probably be one conceptual question on on fatigue. So, for example, what causes fatigue to happen? What is the what is the mechanism for fatigue, which we've now talked about in some degree of detail? And there's a couple practice questions on that um, on the practice final questions, or a couple of fatigue questions on the practice final questions I gave out. There will be, and I'll try to get them out. Maybe today, hopefully. If not today, then probably tomorrow. Yep. So it'll be generally the same format. Eight eight questions, half conceptual, half uh, something you, you'll need a calculator for. One sheet of notes, handwritten, um, or one one side of a sheet of notes, handwritten. Yeah. Since we have one sheet on the last test, we just use the other half of it for this test. <laughs> I I guess. Yeah. So the it, it's non-cumulative. So the the stuff on the on the last test shouldn't be on this one. There may be some concepts like uh, beam bending. There was we talked about beam plasticity, and beam bending plasticity will be there. So you might still need to know that three and four point bending relationship. But um, I'll go through on Wednesday a, a final review and touch on all the things that you actually need to know. Okay. Um, so, here, low cycle fatigue now. So, low cycle fatigue, we're actually applying a high stress and that's going to cause uh, cracks to grow quickly because we're actually plastically deforming our material. Uh, in uh, high cycle fatigue, I have that same stress strain curve. Uh, now I'm going to be cycling my material um, in the elastic regime. So I'm going to be slowly deforming my material in, in what I traditionally refer to as my elastic regime. But uh, I'm going to call this high cycle fatigue stress strain. And so I think I told you fairly early on what's actually happening in this elastic regime isn't truly elastic deformation. Ideally it is, but um, as engineers we make that approximation, we make that assumption. In reality that's not what's happening. You have some, like a couple of dislocations moving, you have some cracks opening, you have some grains sliding around. There's some very minute microstructural deformation happening. Um, and as long as that's high enough, that can cause permanent deformation to your material. And so this is why um, even if we're not in an elastic deformation regime, 
we can still be opening cracks and causing fatigue to happen. So generally, this high cycle fatigue, we're at low stress. Um, and so we see a slow uh, degradation in the strength with the number of cycles. And so here, this low cycle fatigue limit can be on the order of like 10 to the three cycles to failure. This is like one to 10 to the three cycles to failure. High cycle fatigue is like 10 to the three to 10 to the sixth to the sixth. Uh, so this is a thousand and this is a million cycles to failure. And generally, now, depending on your material, um, for certain types of material, steel in particular, uh, eventually you hit what's known as the endurance limit of your material. So you hit sigma E is the endurance lim limit of the material. I don't know why, why I got in there. Uh, the endurance limit of the material where the strength won't degrade anymore, or it degrades so little that it's not really any appreciable degradation. And so in that regime, that's kind of even smaller than this, this low cycle. You're, you're really not applying any stress at all. You're just kind of staying here in this low strain elastic regime. Um, some materials, uh, like aluminum in particular, don't have an endurance limit, but they still display this sort of slowdown in the, in the degradation in properties. So uh, this now I plotted on a log log, or a, a semi-log plot, so a log in the, uh, in the number of cycles. I can also take this data and plot it in a log log space. So now um, I can take that same result, SN curve, and plot now. There we go. Um, so NF, but then the log of number of cycles to failure and my stress amplitude, the, the, the log of the stress amplitude to failure. And what I'll end up seeing is, is something that looks like this. Um, so in this regime here, I, I still have those stochastic failure points that have started to pop up. Um, and what I do now is measure the slope of that so I call the, the slope of this in my log logs uh, of my cycles to failure and my net, or stress amplitude in my cycles to failure has some slope in um, this non-endurance limit regime. And what I say for my relationship between those now is the stress amplitude is equal to some A times number of cycles to failure to the B. So there's some exponential relationship between these two, or power law relationship between these two, um, that uh, I can use to, to find how this degrades. So for these types of materials, um, eventually, what do I have? Sigma F. Uh, it'd be the the slope here in the low cycle, so ev eventually it'll it'll plateau and we'll get that endurance limit depending on the material. Um, so you may you may get a true endurance limit or may kind of keep going down slowly with a different slope. Um, but what we're looking at is how fast it's going to degrade in a in a normal cycle life. Um, so you can imagine now for say the the bolts on an engine uh or not on an engine but uh the bolts connecting an engine to the frame of a car so those mm -hmm. as the engine goes through cycles it's rattling it's rattling at some rpm so there's a, some number of um cycles per minute that these bolts are then being subjected to stress wise and um you have to figure out now 
if you want to design a bolt that is going to survive after, say, 10 to the 6 cycles or forever. And so this is, again, when you're making engineering considerations for design, you have to be thinking about how long you want your part to last, how much stress you want your part to last, how much stress you want your part to withstand, and how much safety you want on top of that. Um, so if you want, say, for an airplane, a part to survive 99.9% um, .9 of the time, you have to take this fatigue into consideration, you have to take the lifetime of the part into consideration, you have to take the, the statistical distribution of strengths into consideration. These are all parts of the picture um, from an engineering design side or a mechanical design side. And it all relates to, I guess in particular, it relates to fracture because most part failure at some point boils down to fracture. But uh, yeah. So for some of these materials, um, Let's say uh, I think I have a table now of some of these to give you some some general values. So now if I take say some material um, ten thirty thirteen forty steel, 2024, aluminum, and then TIE 64, TIE 6 AL 4 V. So um, these are a couple common engineering alloys. Um, this is a common alloy of steel. This is a copper aluminum alloy, um, also a, cop a common aluminum uh, slightly less common, like 6061 or 7075, but still. And then this is uh, the most common titanium alloy. So I think like 90% of the time when you see titanium, it's actually titanium 6 aluminum 4 vanadium. Um, now, the strength of this material, sigma y, uh, the ultimate stress of this material. and then the B for that, how fast it degrades. Um, so here we have something on the order of 1100. Uh, this would be MPA in megapascals. 